Well, welcome. And um, I have to say, I very much am enjoying sort of the lively chatter that was happening. <laughs> <laughs> it's great. Um, so thank you for joining us this afternoon for In Conversation with Stephen Kaltenbach and Francesca Wilma. Today's event is sponsored by the University Galleries in conjunction with the exhibition Teach Art, which is currently on view in the Library Gallery. I'm Kelly Lindner, and I'm the curator for the University Galleries. So I'm going to start off with a bold statement. Stephen Kaltenbach has become a legendary artist in our Northern California region. He is perhaps best recognized for his large-scale painting in the Crocker Art Museum titled Portrait of My Father, beloved by many. We will get to hear more about this painting shortly. Kaltenbach is widely recognized as a conceptual artist. As such, the idea is foremost and his work takes many forms. Painting, sculpture, graffiti, text and language, advertisements, performance, and teaching. Teach Art focuses on Kaltenbach's unique relationship to teaching and the role of pedagogy <coughs> in the conceptual art practice. Kaltenbach, if you didn't know, was a professor here at Sacramento State for over 30 years. And during this time, he engaged and challenged his students to turn their thinking inside out as a strategy for art making. And in turn, Kaltenbach used the teaching environment as an ongoing art life experiment. Teach Art features the recreation of the 1981 room installation, The Window, which emerged from a beginning sculpture class here at Sac State. This piece was first presented in the Els Gallery and attributed to an anonymous group of artists. The Window is a singular experience and exhibits the many themes Kaltenbach has explored throughout his career. Authorship, concealment, faith, death, and the question of what art can be. Stephen Kaltenbach graduated with a bachelor's degree from UC Davis in 1966, followed by a Master of Arts in 1967. He moved to New York shortly thereafter, where he established a reputation in the emerging international field of conceptual art. In addition to a solo exhibition at the Whitney Museum of American Art in 1969, his work was included in a number of important group exhibitions in the US and Europe. In 1970, just as he was achieving career success, Kaltenbach abruptly returned to California and re-emerged as a regional artist. Creating seemingly traditional paintings, exhibiting in local museums, and creating public art sculptures. He also joined the faculty at California State, the University of Sacramento, where he would teach for the next 35 years. Yet his conceptual practice continued and encompassed both art and life. Kaltenbach's work can be found in numerous public, uh, public collections, and he has exhibited wor his work nationally and internationally. He was recently the subject of a solo exhibition at the Minetti Shrem Museum at UC Davis in 2020, and his room installation, What Death Does, was recreated at The Verge in 2023. We are also joined today by Francesca Wilmot, curator at the Crocker Art Museum. Wilmot's own extensive research into Kaltenbach's practice was instrumental in conceptualizing teach art. Her contributions to the exhibition provide a focused look at the preliminary work that Kaltenbach undertook before embarking on Portrait of My Father. Drawings, photographic studies, a lucite model used to generate the effect of light, um, along with two exploratory paintings provide an insightful backstory to Kaltenbach's process and pursuit in the making of the Portrait of My Father. While the painting is not on view in the Sac State exhibition, I hope today's presentation will encourage you to visit or revisit Portrait of My Father at the Crocker. In her talk today, Francesca will consider the connections between Portrait of My Father and the installation of the window. After Francesca's presentation, Stephen will be joining her up front here for uh, some conversation, and then we will be able to open it up to the audience for questions. Wilmot was recently appointed as cura curator to the Crocker, where she oversees the museum's collections of photography and contemporary art. She holds a PhD in the history of art from the Porto Institute of Art in London, and dual master's degrees in art history and arts administration from the School of the Art Institute of Chicago. Her doctoral research examined artists working in Northern California in the 1960s and 70s, and focused on the work of Mike Henderson, Gladys Nielsen, and Stephen Kaltenbach. Wilmot previously held curatorial positions at the Jan Trim and Maria Minetti Schramm Museum of Art at the University of California, Davis, the Museum of Modern Art New York, and the St. Louis Art Museum. Her writing has appeared in Art Forum, A World History of Women Photographers, Irving Marcus, Romance and Disaster, um, Marcel Brothers, a retrospective, and Yoko Ono, One Woman Show, among other publications. Please join me in welcoming Francesca Mola. Thank 
you, Kelly, for your warm introduction. It's so great to see so many people here. It's almost a full house, which is wonderful. And I would expect nothing less for Stephen Kaltenbach's work. Um, so it was really an honor to put together the archival display from the Crocker's collection and archives, um, which you can check out at the University uh, Library Gallery. So um, I think we're going to go over there after this. So please join us for that as well. Um, and I wanted to also, before I get started, to uh, I want to thank Steve for his friendship. Um, we've known each other for about eight years now. And um, I moved out here from New York, where I was working at MoMA. I got to know his work through MoMA's collection. And I knew the legend of Steve Kaltenbach before I got to meet the person. Um, and so when I was at uh, the Minetti Shrum Museum, I was uh, the first curator to be working on his retrospective there. Um, and I decided to leave and pursue a PhD focused um, in part on Steve's work. Um, and that retrospective carried forward uh, by Connie Llewellyn and Ted Mann. So we've had um, many uh, private conversations, but never public ones before. So I'm really excited about this opportunity. So thank you both. Um, so my, present to my presentation today is going to be about 25 minutes in length, and it draws on my research on Kaltenbach's early work and its relationship to his regional artist project. So most discussions of Steve's early work, including my own PhD research, end with the painting Portrait of My Father in 1979. And Sac State's current exhibition really provided me the opportunity and the impetus to extend this thinking forward in time. And time and temporality, in fact, became the essence of this inquiry. And that's what I'll be thinking about today with this presentation. So I've titled my talk, Out of Place, Out of Time, <coughs> Stephen Kaltenbach, 1971 to 1981. And in this presentation, as Kelly mentioned, I connect seemingly disparate uh, parts of Kaltenbach's practice. So his conceptual time capsules, his regional artist persona, his portrait of my father painting, and then ultimately his large-scale collaborative installation, The Window, which is on view. And I use these works to argue that since the late 60s, Kaltenbach has consciously positioned his work as operating outside of both time and place. <coughs> and I hope that this presentation also will introduce Steve's early work to those who are less familiar with it. So I will begin. The new art, it's way, way out. So read an article written by Howard Junker for Newsweek in July 1968. The eight-page article highlighted the rapid pace of new art, ranging from rubber sculptures to light installations. Toward the end of the article, Junker offered a cautionary note from the art dealer, Richard Bellamy. In the face of such pressure, Bellamy forewarned, it can be debilitating for a young artist to enter the race too quickly. Many who make exciting debuts just aren't heard of two or three years later. The veteran art critic, Harold Rosenberg, added, this sense of imminent extinction goes with our age. Guys make it, and it was all men featured in this article, I might add, uh, so they often speak about uh, the guys. Uh, guys make it so quickly today that they're constantly afraid they'll wake up and find themselves not there. Well-known artists like Fred Sandbach, Bruce Nauman, and Stephen Kaltenbach, who you can see here on this slide, were featured alongside artists who have largely been forgotten to time, such as Bill Bollinger on the top and Dan Christensen here on the bottom. With the exception of Kaltenbach, each artist was photographed in a lofty studio or against a dramatic landscape, gazing solemnly beyond the camera. Sporting tasseled hair, his favorite striped t-shirt, and sunglasses, Kaltenbach glances up from his makeshift workstation with an enormous grin. He stands in front of an unremarkable clapboard house in Davis, where Kaltenbach earned his master's in 1967, 
studying with the artists William Tebow, William T. Wiley, and Robert Arneson, among others. This setting that you see here could be anywhere in small town America, however. At the center of the image, between his hands and his bent knees, sits a nondescript metal cylinder, one of the earliest time capsules that elevated Koltenbach's reputation beyond California in the months leading up to the photograph. Koltenbach's first capsules are dedicated to leading names in contemporary art. The art critic Barbara Rose, his friend and former UC Davis classmate, Bruce Nauman, and the Museum of Modern Art. The absences contained within Kaltenbach's early time capsules correspond with a conceptual interest in that which is not there in the late 60s, as theorized by Lucy Lepard and John Chandler in their 1967 essay, The Dematerialization of Art. Kaltenbach has stated of his time capsules I don't say anything about their content, or that there's any content at all, because I found out the concealment of information is as primary a function of the capsule as its preservation. I have to add, it's kind of funny to quote you in front of you. <laughs> That's a new experience. I've talked about your work a lot, but never in front of you, so um, feel free to chime in at any point. Uh, so, Kaltenbach began his time capsules shortly after arriving in New York in September 67. Once there, he quickly earned a reputation by developing alter egos, creating fictitious artworks such as this one. This pot was supposedly glazed with ashes from the second toe of his right foot. <laughs> and unleashing anonymous ads in art form, bearing statements such as, tell a lie, build a reputation, become a legend, and teach art. In New York, Kaltenbach befriended the artist Lila Zano. He exhibited alongside Robert Morris and Robert Smithson, and he featured in major shows curated by Lucy Lepard, Virginia Dwan, and Kenison McShine, including a solo show at the Whitney organized by Marsha Tucker. Just three years later, in 1970, Kaltenbach returned to California and vanished from the New York spotlight. In California, Kaltenbach's work dramatically shifted. Between 1972 and 1979, he completed a 10 by 15 foot painting of his ailing father entitled Portrait of My Father, which is now in the Crocker's collection. And in 1981, he collaborated with students on the room-sized installation, The Window. How did Kaltenbach go from making minimal cylinders to a maximalist portrait and a collaborative installation in just over a decade? Between 1970 and 2010, Kaltenbach lived in the Davis Sacramento area. During his 35-year tenure teaching studio art at Sac State, he completed wall-sized figurative paintings, exhibited in local churches, and undertook civic commissions, like his fountain, a time to cast away stones in front of Sacramento's convention center. In 2010, exactly 40 years after leaving New York, Kaltenbach showed his hand. He had been performing as the regional artist in Northern California all that time. According to the press release for his Los Angeles exhibition, Kaltenbach really didn't drop out at all, but through a series of increasingly minimal art efforts, reduced his life to a 40-year conceptual artwork. And that same year, the writer Sarah Blair Grayworth called this project his elephant project in art form. So this leads me to ask, were Kaltenbach's advertisements, time capsules, and portrait indeed all parts of a larger conceptual project? I argue here that Kaltenbach's regional artist is more than a desperate ploy for attention in response to the frenzied New York art market, or a simple geographic designation. Conceptually, Kaltenbach strikes at the dynamics that determine how the history of art is written and which artists gain widespread visibility and which do not. As Kaltenbach would soon discover, being way, way out has its limits. 
Even in the center of New York, Kaltenbach played upon the qualities of absence and concealment. Shortly after arriving, he had the opportunity to show his slides to the critic Barbara Rose. And he dedicated his first time capsule to her in November of 1967, instructing Rose to please open this time capsule when in your opinion I have attained national prominence as an artist. <laughs> So his placement of seemingly egotistical language on this fair geometric form knowingly jabs at the sanctity of minimalism. In her 1965 essay, ABC Art, Rose wrote that proponents of minimalism, quote, deny the ego and the individual personality, seeking to evoke, it would seem, the semi-hypnotic state of blank unconsciousness, unquote. Unlike Rose's lofty description of minimalism, Kaltenbach's metal cylinders are neither impersonal nor are they timeless. Rather, their function as time capsules insists on a kind of temporal lag, encouraging us to view the present as the past for a future moment. In a practice that moves between mediums and reveals no end of complications the further one peers into it, and I'll add here, he, Steve really likes to target art historians in particular, uh, so it's been a lot of fun. Um, one constant holds true in Kaltenbach's work. Since 1967, he has consciously positioned his work as operating outside of both his time and his place, like a time capsule tucked away for a later date. Though Kaltenbach may have felt out of step with his era, he was not alone. In her work on chronophobia, the art historian Pamela Lee describes the uneasy relationship between artists and the rapid ec economic and technological progress of the 60s. Cutting across movements, mediums, and genres, she writes, the chronophobic impulse suggests an insistent struggle with time, the will of both artists and critics either to master its passage, to still its acceleration, or to give form to its changing conditions. <clears throat> With street works like Morning Peace by the Fluxus artist Yoko Ono, earthworks such as this gallery filled with dirt by Walter De Maria, and conceptual instructions by artists like Sol LeWitt, artists in the 60s also took to task the construction of place. And I should add that these are all artistic pursuits that Kaltenbach uh, also engaged in. So you can see his earthworks drawing here on the left and one of his sidewalk plaques artworks there on the right. While artists went to great ends to emancipate art from the white walls of the museum or the gallery, a few were willing, few were willing to follow this through to its ultimate conclusion by removing themselves from the centrality of the New York art world altogether. I contend that Kaltenbach's confrontation with his temporality and locality are inseparable from the logic of his regional artist persona. Kaltenbach's interest in temporality also extended to the conditions of artistic labor. Though he held a teaching position at the School of Visual Arts in New York, Kaltenbach, like many artists, struggled financially in the late 60s. In November 68, Kaltenbach published his first art form advertisement, simply reading art works. This was just two months before many artists in his circle banded together to form the Art Workers Coalition. Among the Art Workers' grievances was how artistic labor was recognized and compensated by art institutions, namely New York's Museum of Modern Art. Kaltenbach remained on the periphery of the art workers' activities. However, he too was interested in the mechanisms of the art market, how art works. And he began to quantify his conceptual labor, noting that he spent around 250 hours on one time capsule alone. The art historian Julia Bryan Wilson has argued that while the art workers often identified with blue collar laborers of the 1930s, Many resisted the populist overtures of social realism and regionalism. Kaltenbach, however, leaned into such populist themes. Kaltenbach's artworks advertisement appeared in the same issue of Art Forum as an overview of William Agee's 
1930s <coughs> exhibition at the Whitney, written by the New Deal art historian Francis O'Connor. A.G.'s show prioritized 1930s abstraction over American regionalism, as seen in this installation image on the right. In Harold Rosenberg's derisive exhibition review, he wrote that A.G. made no effort to reflect the social situation of the 30s. And Rosenberg noted that one indignant critic suggested that the show ought to have greeted visitors with the figure of an unemployed person peddling apples. <laughs> the next month, Kaltenbach published his second art forum ad, Johnny Appleseed. By evoking this salt of the earth folk legend, Kaltenbach drew not from an America's industrial past favored by his New York peers, but instead he connected with unfashionable folk references that flourished under 1930s American regionalism, a point that I'll return to in more detail shortly. At the height of his New York fame, Kaltenbach continued to nurture the unfashionable, and he developed two alter egos, or what he called life dramas, who made quote unquote bad paintings and sculptures. The first was called SK, which in Spanish loosely translates to what is it, and it also plays upon Steve's initials, SK. So SK was an amateur artist who made flowery couch paintings destined for the Lord and Taylor department store. And Steve has told me, and I've heard him share this publicly as well, uh, that the gallerist there at Lord and Taylor told him to come back once he's continued working on his portfolio. <laughs> and after the art dealer John Enzo Speroni purchased his conceptual work, Kaltenbach traded in his striped t-shirt for a wig, a false mustache, and a double-breasted suit <laughs> befitting of a ceramicist called Clyde Dillon. Though Kaltenbach has refuted any connection between his return to California and the upheaval in the New York art world, the timing is noteworthy. Kaltenbach had grown close to Lee Lozano, and just one month after she stopped making art with her April 1970 dropout piece, Kaltenbach followed a different path to anonymity. He developed his third alter ego, the regional artist. In May of 1970, Robert Morris canceled his Whitney show and co-organized uh, the art strike on the steps of the Metropolitan, which you can see here. The same month, SVA suspended its classes following the massacre at Kent State, and Kaltenbach never returned to his teaching post. As Dan Graham announced at an Art Workers Coalition open hearing, it's time, it seems, to leave all this shit behind. <laughs> the art world is poisoned. Get out to the country or take a radical stance. Kaltenbach decided to get out to the country, or at least what New Yorkers perceived as the country, and he returned to Sacramento. For all intents and purposes, and compared to his New York peers, this was taking a radical stance. By 1971, Kaltenbach was working at Sac State. With more job security and studio time in Sacramento, Kaltenbach spent the next seven years on his painting, Portrait of My Father, his first major work as the regional artist. During this period, Kaltenbach was also a visiting artist at the University of Wisconsin-Madison, where he identified a 10th century Islamic pattern in the archives. According to Kaltenbach's detailed timeline for the painting, he began pattern studies for the work in Madison on <coughs> December 19, 1972, which was a day recommended by his astrologer. And this is a photograph of one of the astrological charts he was using around this time. And this is in the Crocker's archives, this photograph. It was actually sitting beneath my desk <laughs> for, for many months. Um, and then Kelly gave me the opportunity to put this on view in the library gallery so you can see it there and try to decode it. And then at 7 a.m. on November 26, 1973, while visiting his sick father, he photographed the source image for his painting. Then on December 30, 1974, Kaltenbach had a vision of the completed painting in full detail. As he was working on the painting, Kaltenbach relocated to a woodland barn 
where he fashioned a platform and pulleys that hung from the rafters. For over seven years, he spent up to 16 hours each day laboring over the painting, using an airbrush to capture the details of his father's hair and to add celestial flourishes to his forehead, beard, and eyebrows. In Kaltenbach's barn studio, the farmer took the place of the art critic. As Kaltenbach recalls, one day his farmer landlord came in and commented on his father's beard. Them things looked like broom handles sticking out of his cheek. <laughs> Kaltenbach modified his approach accordingly. <laughs> his Sac State colleague, the art historian John Fitzgibbon, who I understood used to teach in the same lecture hall, yes. <laughs> kind of comes full circle, um, went to great lengths to describe Kaltenbach's eccentric lifestyle in California in an essay that he published in 1979. Though his description is verbose, the caricature that he constructs is precisely the point. So I have it quoted here. Fitzgibbon wrote, Kaltenbach has spent much of his life on a farm, and for most of the six years he's devoted to the gigantic portrait of my father, he simply lived with the painting in an old barn near Winters, hard by the antique-filled 19th century wooden Gothic farmhouse of Mr. and Mrs. Walter Jarrett, whose personification of American virtues sometimes presumed to have been lost, uprightness, industriousness, common sense, approaches that of characters in a play. When the temperatures grew too hot, Kaltenbach would build a tree house, and as Fitzgibbon went on to describe, he lived off of fruit, wheat germ, nuts, teas, and a gamut of natural <coughs> foods. <laughs> Fitzgibbon portrays Kaltenbach as a grand wood figure, painting his American Gothic. Wood was a member, as I'm sure many of you know, of the Regionalist Triumvirate in the 1930s, alongside John Stuart Curry and Thomas Hart Benton. Their work had fallen out of favor in the 60s and 70s as being overly sincere and anachronistic, belonging to an entirely different time and place. Unsurprisingly, Kaltenbach has told me that Benton is one of his favorite artists. So that might be a question we can uh, follow up on, on during our conversation as well. Fitzgibbon's quote also brings to mind the idiosyncratic American folk hero, Johnny Appleseed, who lived off the land and slept in treetop hammocks. Johnny Appleseed is a 19th century legend based on the historic figure John Chapman, who planted apple orchards in Ohio, Indiana, and Illinois. Kaltenbach's father, uh, Chap sorry, um, Kaltenbach's father was also the son of a farmer. Within his lifetime, he became a celebrated icon in, o in Ohio, Kaltenbach's father's birthplace. Chapman died in Indiana, but like any successful American folk legend, his stories migrated west without him. He even received credit for planting the apple orchards in California's Central Valley, which surrounded the barn studio. The legend of Johnny Appleseed is useful when thinking about Kaltenbach's alter egos and art form ads, and his commands to tell a lie and become a legend. So I'm not saying that Steve was necessarily thinking about all of this as he was coming up with these references, uh, but I think this is kind of in the air at that moment. Tall tales <coughs> occupy a special place within American history, originating from jostling between the so-called settlers uh, to exaggerate their encounters out west. The caricature that Fitzgibbons painted of Kaltenbach's regional artist persona is the stuff that American folklore is made of. His teach art philosophy. Kaltenbach invited his Sacramento State students to the barn to observe the work in progress. So he would actually use these sessions when he was painting as a method of teaching. And so you can see them here when the painting is still unstretched. Kaltenbach has said that the me best measure of success for his regional artists was to secure a solo show at the local museum. In 1979, the Crocker opened a traveling exhibition of Kaltenbach's portrait, exhibiting it alongside Stoned Maple and Sunset. 
And this painting is now in the Crocker's collection. And these are two works that he started in New York and completed in Sacramento in the early 70s. And then you can see these works in person today, if you wish, at the library gallery alongside those archival materials related to Portrait of My Father. Kaltenbach continued to work on Portrait of My Father once the Crocker Show opened, which is something we do not really allow today. <laughs> um, and he invited his students to come to the gallery uh, to observe him in person. Um, so here's Steve with a group of school children, and you can see some of those painting materials in the top uh, tarp in the lower side of this image. During these years, amid his grief and soul searching, as he confronted the loss of his father, Kaltenbach also found God. Two years later, in 1981, Kaltenbach presented his most extreme example of teach art, the window. Much like Portrait of My Father, the window explores ideas of concealment, absence, anonymity, and mortality. The installation was produced in Kaltenbach's beginning sculpture class and presented anonymously in the Robert Els Gallery at the end of the term, as you can see in this image. Students and pairs of students constructed the different elements of the room. Entering the installation, you're drawn to a mirror, expecting to see your reflection. But instead, you encounter a mirror image of the room that you're standing in. You are not there. Turning to glance at the clock on the wall, the time is two minutes until 12. In the mirrored room, however, the clock is set in the future, two minutes after 12. In the window, much like his time capsules, regional artist project, and portrait of my father painting, Kaltenbach uses time itself as his medium. He molds, shapes, and turns ideas of temporality over and over again, like the clay vessels that he sculpted in TB9 as a student. In Sacramento, Kaltenbach was both out of time, confronting his own mortality, and out of place as the regional artist painting a deeply spiritual, hyper-realistic portrait at a time when the impersonality of minimalism still reigned. Kaltenbach experienced the risks of being way, way out, anonymity. And that's kind of drawing back on that language from Howard Junker's article that opened this presentation. And Kaltenbach decided to keep on going. In the window, he extends his conceptual inquiry into real space, our space. Not only is Kaltenbach out of time and out of place, but now the rest of us are as well. Thank you. Okay, so I think now we're doing a conversation for about 25 minutes. And then we'll have time for Q&A. Yeah. years. 
And I, so your work has often been described in distinct chapters. We talk about your conceptual work in New York between 1967 and 1970, and then your regional artist project after that time. And I was wondering, do you think about your career in this episodic way? And how does the teach art philosophy play into that? Well, I, I think that, that um, phases of art, uh, schools of art, whatever you want to call it, um, all tend to contain aspects that have been with us from the beginning. I think that um, the earliest art um, was four things contained messages uh, intended to um, improve your life in some way, whether, whether it's a cave painting that, that um, was uh, uh, civilization's attempt to provide uh, food, food on the table. They didn't have tables, did they? <laughs> anyway. Um, Eventually. Yeah. To, to provide food to um, modern art, which um, can have um, a, a huge variety of, of um, positive effects from uh, providing information to um, making it at least an attempt to uh, wake people up to a political reality that needs attention to, um, well, I could go on and on. But I, I think that uh, actually, so much, I'm gonna get off, so maybe you can tell me where I left. Okay, uh, okay. 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 So, um, I, uh, in, in um, painting the portrait of Dad, I went through a series of uh, conscious intentions. Um, first, it was that I wanted to paint um, something with kind of what I thought of as hyper-realistic detail. And so I was thinking like, like maybe hair, that every hair would be painted uh, which ended up being uh, broom handles, according to my landlord. <laughs> but um, so I I was pursuing that, thinking I owned a Persian cat, and thinking I was going to paint my cat. But in my experience of art, um, I'm not exactly the boss. The things just are constantly occurring. So I was uh, actually in Wisconsin, maybe trying to dodge this with, uh, for the sake of my cat. But uh, my sister sent me a photograph of my dad, uh, who was being cared for by my mother. And um, uh, she had, it was hard for her to uh, shave him. So she grew his beard. And I just saw this little snapshot, and I thought, well, Looks like um, Teddy is off the table now, and, and uh, I'm going to be painting this picture of my dad because he kind of looked like <coughs> I'm really getting dry. Okay. I may not be strong enough. Oh, no. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Aging does certain things. <laughs> you, you, you should be aware of that. Uh, uh, there's some things. Like, uh, I'm not allowed on ladders anymore. <laughs> so, maybe, maybe if you have tall paintings to do, do them. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, so, going back to teach art, I have a few images here of the different places that it showed up. So, we have art forum here on the left, and then one of the time capsules that's on view in the library gallery show. 
And then I found this quote, it was in Art Forum, your interview with Cindy Nemser from 1970. And you say that my teaching is one of my most important conceptual art involvements now. So if we could talk about that, teaching as a conceptual art involvement. Um, well, I, I mean, uh, making art is communication. Mm -hmm. um, if you're uh, thinking about uh, different audiences, certainly, uh, a classroom is a great place to find an audience. <laughs> held hostage for a little while, too. Pardon? They're held hostage in the classroom. <laughs> yeah. Oh, so, um, I mean, you have a certain uh, amount of power because of um, the great thing. Uh, usually, unless you uh, choose to give that up, uh, which I decided that I didn't want uh, grades to be a part of it, so my students benefited from that <laughs> because, uh, I mean, I had to pass them, so uh, I, I got lectured numerous times by my peers on the faculty for ruining the grade point average. And, and <laughs> but, um, and I'd love to see a show of hands. Who here was one of Steve's students? Oh my goodness. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. About eight people. So I think that's also a testament to your methods. Uh, and, and also yeah. my, uh, the fact that my marbles are rolling away. <laughs> <laughs> because I'm not recognizing anybody. <laughs> yeah, it was a long time ago. Yeah, yeah but okay. <laughs> so thinking about teach art in relationship to these two different works, where Portrait of My Father is not often discussed in relationship to teach art, the window is for obvious reasons. Um, and these works really couldn't be more different on their face. So Portrait is deeply personal. It was painted over a seven year period in isolation, in a barn. And then the subject matter, your father is visible in great detail. Meanwhile, the window was completed in a very finite period, a semester. It was a collaborative work rather than a work done in isolation. Um, and then the subject, who you would expect to see through the mirror, is actually not there. And yet, they're both you know, part of this teach art philosophy. So I was wondering how that, how you kind of, it, do you see these as being part of like two sides of the same coin, or what was your thinking around that? It's the same coin, mm -hmm. and uh, I found that your work can express the same ideas in the same uh, intention and, the, uh, and and look entirely different. It's it's uh, two completely different things. Can yeah. So, but um, I I felt that um, the the teach art process was generated by its effectiveness. In my opinion, I I felt. There were uh, teaching a per person how to do art and what art was was a very iffy situation because <laughs> that's exactly what you don't want to do. And my, and I, I mean, that was my feeling. What, what, uh, it's a very personal expression. And if you go into the studio knowing what to do because your professor told you how to do it, it's, uh, there's a, uh, that's not good to me. And so I was uh, wrestling with my first years with teaching about how to deal with expressing um, the technique and um, even approach um, and how, how I could do my job and avoid um, the, the uh, conflict of, of um, 
laying it all out when when really um, it's you're on your own. You know, you're in your studio. You, it, to, for the work to be good, um, it has to contain you in some essence. And I think that there's a, people uh, like my favorite artists. Uh, Thomas Hart Benton. Right. Um, <laughs> find a way to do it. Uh, they, and he was a teacher as well. So I hope he uh, learned what, what I learned. Mm -hmm. Was that uh, allowing people to see my solutions to the problem of being an artist seemed to be the most uh, par powerful uh, method or an approach that I, I have. And so um, I uh, felt that uh, that's something, although these two works look different. Um, they performed the same thing. I was working here while painting the painting, and every year I ordered my students to come to my studio, which was, uh, I think it was 40 miles away. Oh, wow. I can't remember now. It was between Woodland and Winters. Yeah, right? it was mm -hmm. in a barn on a uh, 640 acre ranch, which is actually a square mile. And um, I had no uh, address, no phone. Um, I, I did get mail my, through my landlord and landlady, and they'd bring them out to the studio for me if I got uh, mail. And, um, which so. is it's so fascinating in relation to ideas of anonymity, which you were exploring much earlier on, but then to actually move somewhere where you literally don't have an address. I, I liked it a lot. And, 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 and I, I had an amazing amount of uh, visitors out there considering all that. Um, and so, um, I mean, I also uh, didn't have a bathroom. I'll, I'll, I'll let you think about that later. <laughs> but that's true. I, I mean, I had privacy on 640 acres. So, I mean, who needs a bathroom? Oh, I mean, sometimes one of those rain. What am I doing? But um, it, it was not a welcoming uh, situation. And uh, having that as a, as a <coughs> lifestyle in my place seemed to be very useful uh, because this painting did take a long time. I, Lot, lots of brush strokes on that. And um, also periods of time where, th this is something that I think is important to think about. That, um, there are times when I really didn't know what to do next. Uh, and so I'd spend three months uh, at the back of my studio sitting there looking at it. And in a way I consider that working. It, it was working. It's, it's something. We all do that. Maybe just maybe it just seems to me that it was more for me than for you because uh, it was kind of um, um, challenging. I I and yet I, I really liked that challenge a lot. I, I um, somehow trusted the fact that I was on a project that I. I couldn't see my way through to the end. At, at times, uh, very it was very dim, and, and um, so I just not having a time schedule. I had all the time in the world, so I could just sit there and think about it, and, and not think about it, and um, just let it, let it come to. You know, so anyway. So this idea of time is something I talked about in the presentation and your time capsules and the way you're thinking and shaping time. And we, uh, we've had a few pre-conversations before this conversation to get warmed up. We've talked previously um, the past few weeks about the Greek concept of time. And there's two different words for time. There's uh, chronos and kairos. 
and Kronos is like chronological linear time, and Kairos is more like spiritual you know, spiritual time or synchronicity. It's like almost like the flow state, like when you're transcending um, the linear time. And of course, with both of these works, you are undergoing a spiritual transformation as well. And I was wondering if you could share like how does time and your thoughts about time fit into that? Sure. Uh, um, yeah, I, I'm a Christian, uh, not through my own choosing. I was a Buddhist. And, um, so you were a Buddhist when you started Portrait of My Father, right, and right. a Christian when you finished. Yeah, and um, so um, I, I've never been that interested in religion, but um, when I um, ha had an experience that uh, was very interesting because it, it seemed to be impossible. It was, um, well, let's see if I can be more accurate about this. I come from a family who, uh, uh, I mean, if you didn't get to know them well, you might think they were schizophrenic because they have these experiences where they uh, see things and hear things, especially as they get older. And um, so that, that was part of my life, too. Um, uh, for instance, when my dad died, uh, my, one of my sisters at the funeral just, she was trying to talk like I am now. And uh, she uh, was seeing my, seeing my father. And, uh, one of my teaching methods, when I was working, I was crying during the class. <laughs> I did not intend to do that now, but uh, these are, are very deep, uh, obviously, uh, seated emotional things uh, that I go through. And uh, I'm, I'm so grateful that I have this. Uh, basically, it's kind of like I'm grateful to be a schizophrenic, but um, th this was one where my sister, um, we were at the funeral, and she, she was happy to have this vision of my dad. And she described him uh, as he was, which was uh, young, uh, joyful, uh, very happy with where he was. And, um, it, it's, uh, I'd say the sort of beginning of, uh, he, my dad died during this, 1974, and um, the, the beginning of uh, me taking things more seriously. She's uh, uh, two years younger than I am, and is uh, someone who um, <coughs> I, no, no, my life. I, I uh, have come to trust her uh, very, very much. She's a, a good, serious person, and so this had a lot of impact. And then uh, uh, I'll, I'll try to wind this up. Uh, my brother invited me the next day to. Uh, he had a house in Berkeley. The, the funeral was at our house in Berkeley, just private. And he had this house and he said, hey, we can go over there. And he was a Krishna at the time, and I was a Buddhist. And he said, you can do your Buddhist thing, and uh, I'll do the, my Krishna thing. And there's a lot of bedrooms. Uh, and uh, so we, we thought that was a great idea. So I was, uh, I don't know if you know um, Buddhism, but I was uh, sitting on this hard little cushion uh, called a zafu and facing a wall about uh, five feet away, a blank wall, as blank as any of the white area here. And I just decided, usually uh, I do it for 40 minutes, but I decided, oh, I'm just going to do it all night. I don't have anything else to do. And this is, my dad has been gone for one day. Uh, that's never going to happen again. And so um, I, I was doing that for hours. About three in the morning, 
concert in the wall just Just be patient with me. The wall just caved in, and <clears throat> I was looking at a a pile of pirate treasure. It's huge cut gems of all different colors, and um, <clears throat> coins, and, and a couple. It was pirate treasure because there were a couple of scimitars, uh, you know those scurvy swords <laughs> that pirates used. And there was, a, uh, I still remember there was a couple of necklaces hanging from the hilt of the swords. And um, it was hyper realistic. I was, I mean, I didn't know my, my brain was capable of doing that. Thank you. Actually, I don't think there's any leakage. <laughs> Uh, okay, so uh, the um, so you had a I, vision. I had this vision. Yeah. I was uh, sitting there admiring it, or sort of being dumbfounded, and I heard my dad's voice, and it, it said too much, and then it said it again, much more emphatically too much. And his voice was his, uh, obviously, clearly. I mean, you know, even, um, you know, he hadn't had that kind of voice for years because he'd been ill. But it was when he, it, it was his voice that I remembered when he was young. And when he used to uh, tell me uh, I needed to change my ways and didn't want to spank me. <laughs> he, he would <laughs> tell me to change my ways, and very emphatically. And so, uh, after that, I had time to think about it. It was uh, totally obvious to me that um, he wanted me to uh, reduce my um, level of living. I, I was single, working here. I was living in a. a apartment with a studio attached, a house with a studio attached. Uh, and um, the studio wasn't quite big enough for the big canvas, so it was waiting for something else. But I had uh, collections of, uh, I had a plant collection, an antique collection, a toy collection, an art collection. And I got rid of all of it just within a month. I, I just found a way out from under it and moved to a, a single room. And then uh, someone in the house where I was living knew about the farmer who had the barn. And I, it was just like click, click, click. And I was in, in my barn, yeah. which was basically, I didn't change it much at all. It, it was uh, just, I figured it was good enough for me. And uh, immediately the painting started moving. Yeah. So, uh, I think uh, I think I have a certain talent for weirdness, and <laughs> even though you may not be quite there. <laughs> I think you can find this stuff. It's it's not just uh, esoteric. You know, it's 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 all there if uh, you're willing to um, get. A, Give it a chance uh, that, that it's real. And you also had a vision related to the window as well. Of course. And I want to make sure we have time to talk about the window as well. Okay. Um, I can talk about working my father all day, of course. But um, that, so your vision for this piece came much earlier, and it's not quite as the way you described it to me was not as like, emotionally wrought as the vision you had for your father, the father uh, painting. So can you tell us about your vision for this piece and how sure. that I'll, informed yeah, your approach? Yeah. Oh, uh, so usually when I cry, it's because I'm so delighted about something that it, it strikes me emotionally. 
And um, the um, vision for the window uh, was uh, just more astounding and, in a way, impersonal and surprising. I wasn't looking for anything. I was traveling on a ferry boat between uh, Massachusetts and Martha's Vineyard, which is maybe that's part of Massachusetts anyway. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't know. But I was just uh, going to visit a friend on the East Coast. And um, uh, most of you haven't been in the Navy probably, so uh, I'll just say walls. But on the main deck, I uh, exited the in interior part out onto a place called the promenade deck, which is a deck which has a, 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 a deck over it, so it has a roof, and walls, which are su supposed to be, be called, um, oh, I forget the name right now, uh, the term. Uh, but, um, so, and then uh, it's open to the it's open that to the water, to the ocean, or where wherever you're sailing. In this case, it's a very close ocean, very close to between this island and the coast of Massachusetts. And um, there's a, a two bars going across, so everybody doesn't fall off if they're backing up or you know not careful enough. But it's completely open to the ocean and to the light. And so it's very bright light coming into the promenade deck. And this, this wall on the, into the interior is mostly closed. There's some windows, but there's not a lot of light coming out. So, so I was in this situation where I, I was on this uh, kind of wide room space that was much lighter on this side because it was right out to the light. To this side, it was much darker. And I was closer to the <coughs> inboard uh, uh, side. And so I, I looked to my right, and there was a uh, window in, in, the, in the wall. And, but I mean, I mean it was, there was a mirror in the wall. That, that was my take on it. So I thought I was looking at a mirror. And because I was, uh, you've seen sometimes when you're standing in front of a class or something like that, you're in a dark area and you're looking out at a bright area. You don't see your reflection in the, in the glass of the door or whatever because of the fact that you're darker. And so that's what was happening. I was looking at this thing that I thought, excuse me, that I thought was a mirror because looking looking into the mirror what I, I would it, it was actually a window but looking into what I thought was a mirror was the ocean <clears throat> because there was an absolute mirror image of this promenade deck. They put a bulkhead that was the word I was looking for means a wall. Uh, halfway down the promenade deck. So there's like two uh, identical rooms side by side, one, one wall missing on both that you can look out and you can see the waves moving and so on. So I was looking and through this window and seeing waves moving and it was uh, identical. And so I thought I was looking at a mirror. And so I approached this mirror, and as I was getting closer to it, I was struck by the fact that I wasn't reflected. So I was actually seeing the piece completed there. You're saying this piece, but... The, yeah, 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 this piece. And it was, uh, my mind was being completely blown, and I'm like, what is this? It's, it's hard to make sense of that kind of phenomenological experience where you're just not there. Yeah. Yeah. And so this, immediately I thought, I can do this. <laughs> <laughs> I, I walked up to it, saw that it was 
was a, a mirror, a, a window, not a mirror. And I did, as I got into the light more, I could see, I could see my, myself reflected lightly in the glass. Mm -hmm. And so I thought, but that doesn't have to happen because I don't have to put glass in the mirror. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and so I can, it can just be a window, which is yeah. what I call the, it. The title. And I have a few details. We're, I think we're almost out of time, so we're not going to be able to like, unpack these, but we'll be in the gallery, so if people want to ask questions or look at the details. Did, did I there. use up the question and answer period? Oh, no, it was perfect. You, um, okay. The perfect amount of time. So I'll just click through these so you can kind of get a preview. And then I just had one final question for you before okay. we open it up. Um, and. I'm curious, what was it like for you to recreate this piece in an entirely different time and place? Sort of different place, <laughs> still in Sacramento, but so, in a, at a different time in your life. Right. And you play with chronology a lot with your work. You're often creating works for earlier time periods. You think about time in a very malleable way. And I'm curious, revisiting this piece from 1981 today, what was that experience like for you? Well, uh, this piece, well, the vision for this piece happened when I was in New York, uh, just before I moved into the barn. Okay. So I was, be I was beginning this kind of monster project, The Portrait of Dad, that I didn't know what it was going to take, didn't understand. And so this, remain in my mind and uh, commonly, not, I mean, I wasn't obsessed. Oh, well, yeah, I was. Um, I would say at least on a monthly basis, I would be thinking about this and, and thinking, I, I just, I've got to do this sometime. And so uh, when the portrait of dad was finished, and um, I was starting class here. I, I had a beginning sculpture class. This wasn't premeditated. I, I went into class and I thought, hey, these people all do artwork. I can get some help here. <laughs> <laughs> and, and so I said, I think that um, we need to know what our project is. We have a class project that we're going to be working on this semester. And we're all going to be working on different parts, aspects of the same thing. Um, if you don't want to do that, um, there, there are uh, a list of other professors uh, teaching, or at least one of them teaching sculpture. And maybe you should think about that. And I told them what this basically what this project was going to be, although I didn't know certain things to tell them, like I didn't know about the clock, I didn't know about the rocking chair. There were a lot of aspects to it. What I knew about was the, the hole on the wall with a window with a mirror frame around it and the, the, the table in front of it with some things on the table. Yeah, so, um, then uh, one person actually um, decided to drop the class, but then she was <laughs> became interested within a couple weeks of what we were doing. Uh, took re re enrolled, and um, she was became the one who did the painting of the fire. Oh wow! Yeah. Amazing. With a close up of that. Here we are. Uh, so there's. Well, is, it, is there anybody here who hasn't uh, seen the piece yet? Yeah. I kind of think I won't talk about it, although you probably already know too much. Yeah, you have to see it in person. We don't want to give it all away. So. <laughs> but, we might have there were, there were two people, another person painted the, the uh, reflection. And these two uh, styles, are, are their styles. So they, they brought a lot of personality to that. 
And um, I just quickly, one last thing, have to say that whenever I can get other people to do my work, <laughs> turn out better. <laughs> Did I answer it now? I, I think so. I think oh, that okay. was great. And the conversation continues. So we'll, um, it's not the end. So we'll keep uh, talking okay. about it. But um, I think at this point, I just want to thank you again for this conversation and Kelly for, for having us here today. Um, and we can open it up for questions. Yes. So I, I know that for some of you, you class is over and you may need to leave, so feel free to do that. We'll have to just be in here probably for another 15 minutes, but oh, your hand went up first. <laughs> um, I just wanted to ask, like, how could I, I do art as well, I just wanted to just ask and see how it felt to do an art piece that took so long, that took seven years, so it was the emotional response. Uh, I guess it was the emotional like, um, journey that we went through with that. Well, um, Can everyone hear the question? I can repeat it. Um, so, um, the question... Yes, I was going to ask you. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I'm sorry. Um, the question was that uh, this portrait of my father was such a long journey. It took seven years. And what was the emotional... Can you say emotional journey? Or yeah, what was the emotional like, process of... The emotional process. Um, like going through a painting that took so long to do, like I would, I would be really impatient. <laughs> well, I, I, that's secret. <laughs> but, um, I'll, I'll, I'll give you the short, uh, uh, cleaned up version, I mean, which you probably won't think is all that cleaned up. <laughs> but um, it was difficult psychologically, and. Yeah, at times it was uh, 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 crazy joyful. I mean, just uh, uh, overwhelmingly happy. And, and uh, I was uh, a uh, user of marijuana before it was legal. Uh, I, I hope there's no cops here. <laughs> So, uh, it's legal now. Yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. So you can't, can't get me through. <laughs> I know there's something. Sins have been forgiven. <laughs> so, uh, uh, it's still, still, um, I uh, went on to, uh, what was it said that marijuana leads to uh, higher drugs? No, hard it's, a, hard it's, like a, it's a gateway drug. A gateway drug. <laughs> higher drugs. Um, uh, like, um, <laughs> but mushrooms, was, uh, but cactus. What's the cactus one? Peyote. Peyote. Yeah, okay. So, um, I, I, I blame this on my students because in New York, I, I invited two of my best students to dinner, and they seemed like a, about, to be about 10% smarter than they ever had shown in class. <laughs> so afterwards, I, I said, what, what do you guys, why didn't you bring this to class? And oh, they laughed and, and said, oh, we, it's not, it's, not, it's the, the, the chemical in, Mescaline? Mescaline, yeah. He said, oh, we, we took this drug called mescaline. Now, um, you come to dinner? Isn't that like LSD? And they said, no. Said, no, it, it just makes things clearer. And, uh, and we brought you two of them, two capsules. And so <laughs> they gave me these two capsules in the lab. And um, I was happened to be near my door to my loft. And I had a glass of water and I was about to take these two capsules and there's a knock on the door. It was perfect, perfect timing. Which my life was full of perfect timing, so you probably are getting the idea. Anyway, uh, it's my uh, neighbor up, from upstairs who had never visited me. We were acquaintances and we liked each other. 
that I don't ever remember him coming, uh, coming down. And I opened the door and he said, hi, what you doing? <laughs> I said, well, <laughs> and then um, I said, I have two of these. Want to take one too? And so we took one, and uh, I am so grateful that it was one instead of two. <laughs> because, I mean, for the next hour, it was really great to have company. Because for the next hour, my reality got so thin. But also, I was being entertained by these amazing forms floating in the air and uh, just the ideas that I was having and stuff. But um, it, it, it just wasn't something that I would, I would recommend. <laughs> uh, even doing it all, I was doing it for the first time alone. It, it was something that I was very grateful to have had the experience with uh, backup, kind of. And so we were acting like it is, you know, going up to his place. His paintings were all leaning against the wall with their backs showing. And uh, he was painting on unjust of canvas, so there, uh, the paint leaked through. So we're seeing the back side. And we were both saying, oh, these look better than the front side. <laughs> That, that's the way it went. Anyway, uh, what was the question? <laughs>